So welcome to the long overdue and I'm led to believe awaited debrief of the Marathon de Saabs 2023. As you can see, with what I hold in my hand, we fucking did it, job done and mission complete. But what I'm gonna talk about over the course of this video is what it actually fucking took and what it takes to get something that money can't fucking buy. Start at the beginning, um, you don't know what route you're going to get, you don't know what the weather conditions are gonna be like until you literally get on the coach landing in Morocco. And the first thing you get handed is this, and this basically becomes your fucking Bible and a source of insanity for the rest of the week. The first thing we did when we got on the coach as you flick through and comprise and contain within this is the route. It is every single checkpoint, every single bearing, everything you need to successfully complete, on paper at least, the Marathon de Saabs. And straight from the get-go, our attention got drawn to the fact, holy fuck, this is a hard course. Not only was day one, one of the longest day ones in MDS history, in day four, I believe was the second longest long stage in MDS history. And to compound on top of all of that, we also experienced a heat wave in the Sahara, which meant that this year was the hardest MDS on record based on the number of dropouts, DNFs, and people who voluntarily withdrew themselves from the course. What I'm gonna talk about in this video is what I learned from it, what we took away from it, and ultimately how it has grown me, helped me in order to coach other people and live and improve life as a result of that. Starting with day one, anyone who's watched you know, the YouTube series up until this point in time might think, okay, you prepared effectively, appropriately, and thoroughly, and I felt that way too. That being said, day one absolutely fucking pulled my pants down as it did for so, so many people. There were so many uncontrollable variables, so many unexpected hardships and bits of adversity that really just felt like you'd absolutely gone fucking 12 rounds. Um, as I said, it was one of the longest stage one of any MDS on record, and you felt it. It was 36 kilometers with some pretty aggressive inclines, and even at that stage, the temperatures were in the mid to high. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what that kind of means, you can cook beef low and slow at about 51, 52 degrees Celsius, and that is the temperature we're actually experiencing later in the week. But day one, I can palpably remember uh, getting stuck into it and thinking, holy fuck, this is a lot more than I thought I could handle. I've bitten off a lot more than I can chew. And actually, when I got back to the, uh, the bivouac, the tent that night, after about six and a half, seven hours out on the course, I thought, fuck me, I can't do this. I cannot do this. I cannot do that again and again and again for longer, incrementally harder distances over the course of the week. What actually allowed me a degree of peace and what actually allowed me to gain composure in that moment was getting back in a tent and seeing real good lads, hardworking fucking blokes, tough men, all saying exactly the same. And so much of what pulls you through the MDS is actually that sense of community. I'm gonna talk about a little bit later today about genuine, authentic human connection removed from social media and what people are pretending to be, and actually people just being themselves. But day one, straight out of the gates, pulled no punches. It was straight into a fucking all out war. It was hotter than I thought it could ever have been. It was tougher than I thought it could ever have been. And I paired up with a couple of guys from our tent. We ran from um, the start line to checkpoint one and immediately I started fucking going under, as did a lot of people because we really hadn't, despite all the preparation, despite our levels of fitness being probably the fittest we've ever been, you know, carrying in excess of 25 pounds of kit in high 40 degree temperature over that terrain, people were going down already within the first couple of hours owing to the heat. It was a really, really fucking tough day. But in that moment, what you had to very quickly understand was regulating your expectations and fucking changing the mission, changing the objective. The objective was no longer about securing a place in the position. The objective was now about learning what you need to do and was about regulating these non-controllable variables and just sticking the fucking course and utilizing your mental coping skills, trusting yourself, your training and your team to get you through that. Because it was a fucking dark moment we came in from day one. Um, a fantastic guy, very, very fit, very, very tough guy in our tent, came in the day one, got on all fours and immediately started projectile vomiting and went down with not in substantial heat exhaustion. And straight away then we realized this is not necessarily fun. This is not something we can laugh and joke away as, oh yeah, it's a bit tough, but it's not that bad. This is real fucking tough stuff. And on that first day alone, over 35 competitors will have, have to be taken off the course, had to be medically withdrawn or voluntarily withdrew themselves. So it was a fucking tough day.
to be honest then, days two and days three were much the same. You were always finding ways to make it seem like it was a little bit easier, but owing to the fact we were in the grip of a fucking uh, heat wave, like it was just getting hotter and hotter. So the start lines were being pulled earlier and earlier, so you're getting less sleep, it was getting hotter. And day two, for an example, was six kilometers shorter, but was the highest elevation of any day on the course, including going over Jebel Al Oftal, which is one of the highest peaks in the Sahara Desert and is made out of fucking sand. So imagine how hard it is to walk over a sand dune at the beach, times it by about 100 in terms of height, and then do it in a fucking oven carrying 25 pounds of kit. It was fucking unbelievable. But the main thing that most people were apprehensive, myself included, about was the long stage. Long stage is day four. So by that point, you've already covered over 100 kilometers in austere conditions, in real heat, you sleep deprived, malnourished, in several thousand calorie energy deficit, and you've got to do 90 kilometers, for which the cutoff time is 36 hours. Now, many people have different strategies for this, and basically, I was very, very proud of my ability to adhere to my game plan. No one ever thinks they're the person that's gonna quit, but on that one day alone, over 120 competitors were medically withdrawn or voluntarily withdrew themselves from the quarter. So over 10% of the field were withdrawn in one fucking 36 hour period. So in a nutshell, this was my Bible. You can, see, you can see my workings from the event when I was trying to figure out through the fucking, the fog of sleep deprivation for exhaustion, through the heat, I was trying to figure out where I was, to take my bearings and go through the night. And as a team, 1078 was able to come in in a little under 23 hours, which is again, is a source of enormous pride as working as a team and sucking it in from fucking London town and really digging in my eyelids, we were actually able even to run across the finish line, mainly so we weren't overtaken by a French guy behind us. Unfortunately, day four did see one of our tent members um, be evacuated via helicopter due to really, really severe heat exhaustion. I can't speak enough to how oppressive and how, if I'm honest, fucking dangerous the heat is in that environment. Just before checkpoint two, um, sorry, just after checkpoint two on the long stage, we were into rolling sand dunes and these were soft sand. These are like lung busting, leg draining at the best of times. And we were experiencing heat in that temperature. It's estimated mid 50 degrees. The heat is just bouncing back up at you. And the next thing you've got to look up at is we were going back over Jebel El Oftar, one of the biggest fucking Jebels in the Sahara Desert in the heat of the middle of the day. Um, we went under a tree and again, one of our guys from the tent took a knee, started to look unwell. And when things go wrong out there, they can go wrong really quickly. And unfortunately, um, he began convulsing, vomiting, and went down with really severe heat exhaustion, at which point we then had to utilize the GPS beacons in the emergency, seat, uh, the emergency um, SOPs to bring in a helicopter to get him extricated and exfiltrated from the area, at which point he was taken back and received medical care and was eventually flown back home to the UK to be safe and sound with his missus and kids. Since that time, he's actually proposed successfully to his missus, who is now his fiance. So massive congratulations to him. I know that he'll be watching this. Later into that day, obviously you are going through the night and navigating and uh, like trekking, heading, running, whatever you want to call it through the desert at night is unlike anything I've ever experienced. You could not help but just take a moment to zoom out and stand and look at the stars, the massive expanse of the night sky above you is unlike anything I've ever experienced. And owing to the fact that it's a 36 hour stage, the spread of humans is very, very long. So for a long period of time, you're absolutely on your own with nothing but the sand dunes, the stars, and a compass bearing to keep you company. It truly was unlike anything I've ever experienced. And owing to the fact that heat dropped a little bit as well, it was down to sort of 30 degrees at night, you could actually push, you could actually read in some of the miles. And for a little bit, it was almost enjoyable. Um, fortunately, I met up with a remainder of 1078 at checkpoint five. We got a fucking coffee on and in the true spirit of like just British stiff upper lip, we had a bit of a dig at one another, bit of banter, had a crack and that was it. We pulled together as a team and ran across the finish line in just under 23 hours, crossing the line at about 10 past six in the morning. One of the biggest lessons I took away from the marathon of Saabs is actually just how far your body can and will go if you ask it to. And I'm not just talking a little bit outside of your comfort zone or a little bit better than maybe you're used to. The thing that it is actually capable and able of doing if you can just engineer a way to start is truly unbelievable. You know, day one kicked the ass out of me, day two and three were no less than relenting, it was horrific. And to do an ultra marathon, 90 kilometers on day four, I was there feeling like there was absolutely no way, shape or form, there was absolutely no way in hell I was gonna be able to do a marathon the next day because as everyone was, you're limping, you're down and out, you're massively dehydrated, you're malnourished. But if you can just find a way to get yourself to that start line on day five, lo and behold, 
you can run yet another marathon. And that is true, not just in the desert, but to every single facet and walk of our life. If you can just find a way to start, I guarantee your body knows what to do. If you trust yourself, trust your training and trust your team, you can fucking do it. Another one of the most powerful lessons I took away from the desert that I believe we can all apply to everyday life is our ability and the necessity of regulating our expectations. When all of us set foot in the desert, we didn't know what we were going to expect. We didn't know what the course was going to be like. We didn't know what the temperature was going to be like. So we had an expectation of how fast we think we should be running and what it is we actually want to achieve. But presented with new information and uncontrollable variables, those who unfortunately found themselves on the wrong side of the medical staff were the people I feel that weren't regulating their expectations expectations. As soon as we got a taste of that heat, as soon as we got a taste of how challenging, how difficult and how fucking hard this is really going to be, the first thing we had to do was check expectations and understand the mission had changed. It was no longer about achieving X, it was now about achieving Y and understanding how we need to regulate our behaviour, how we need to regulate our emotions and our self-talk to be complicit with the new goal and not by killing ourselves by pursuing an old goal. And regulating expectations was absolutely complicit in our ability to persevere in undulating circumstances. So outside of people just being medically withdrawn, there are also a contingent of people who voluntarily withdrew themselves from the course. Now, my heart goes out and I have the absolute utmost respect and admiration for everyone who placed themselves in that environment. I wanna be really, really clear on that. But I was witnessing a certain belief system and subsequent set of behaviors that led to certain people voluntarily withdrawing before maybe their body had actually truly given out. And I started questioning, mate, what is that belief system? What is it? And from what I could identify, from what I could feel in myself, it was focusing on the outcome and it was not breaking the task down, zooming out and segmenting it. Don't forget that if you're driving at night, you'll very rarely see the end destination. You can only see what's in your headlights. But if you focus just on what's in your headlights, that will see you safe and sound to your end destination. What I mean by that is, if, if you're absolutely fucking dangling, if you're really hanging out and you're hurting and you're hungry and your feet are blistered and you're sleep deprived, like you're in a bad way. If all you can think about is, oh my God, I've got another 60 kilometers to go, it is, takes you to such a deep, dark place. I cannot speak enough of how much your head can go down and the depths of despair that it will really take you to. You'll be soul searching and sucking it in from every possible angle, just looking for a source of inspiration. And if you can't find a way to break it down in that moment, ultimately, that's always so, put so many people withdrawing themselves from the race because it was really, really fucking tough. And I think those people have learned so much about themselves in that instance and in that moment. But for me and for conversations with 1078 and other people who I was fortunate enough to meet, what I noticed they were all doing was segmenting it, was breaking it down. And that's essentially what you can see I was doing in here. It might look like just scribbles on a piece of paper, but I was breaking it down and I was finding a way to never be concerned with anything beyond the next checkpoint. Just get to the next five kilometers, the next 10 kilometers. And when you get there, I'm gonna have a square of real meal bar. I'm just gonna have a little bit of food. I'm gonna allow myself to sit down for two minutes. I'll replan, I'll reassess, and then I'll go again. Then again, all I'm gonna worry about is the next checkpoint. Now, this is such a powerful, pertinent lesson for everyone in every walk of life because the path of self-mastery, of personal development, of growth and evolution is one that essentially never ends. And even if there is a finite goal, whether that's getting the promotion, getting a black belt on jiu-jitsu, running an ultra marathon, doing your first Ironman, sometimes the timeline is so long and it seems so far away, it becomes intimidating and it feels like there's no way I can co possibly close that discrepancy and close that gap. But if you can find a way to segment the process, even at sometimes it was just, can I get to that lone tree? Can I get to that rock? If I get to that vehicle, then I can do this and I can do that and I can do that. And if you find a way to segment it, if you find a way to break it down and create rewards and little milestones and checkpoints, I guarantee by doing that, by living one footstep at a time, often you can fucking go far further than you would ever have anticipated if you're trying to focus only on the outcome. Always focus on the process. And perhaps one of my own favorite lessons I took away from the desert was the ability to zoom out. When you're in the midst of real struggle, real challenge and the depths of despair, it's so easy to zoom in on yourself, on that time, on that moment in time when your feet are blistered and bleeding, when you're hurting, when your traps are screaming and all you wanna do is quit and you don't think you can find a way to carry on. When in that moment, if you're able to find a way to zoom out, you realize that everyone around you is hurting too. 
Everyone around you is going through the same. Everyone else is in pain. So what's allowing them to continue and not me? It's just how I'm thinking about it. Their body's doing it, so my body can do it. It's simply how I'm thinking about it. And if I zoom out, and if I expand that timeline, if I expand that time horizon, in a week from today, I know I'll be in that hotel with a fucking mud around my neck and a beer in my hand, and I'll be the happiest man in the fucking world. This is not the end of the world. I simply need to zoom out, stop ruminating, and find a way to keep taking action. So I've spoken a lot to the hardship of being in the desert and, and how much of a, a, a real challenge that event is. But I also want to talk about a couple of my favorite elements I took away from the experience of the Mara from the Saabs. The first is the simplicity. There is no technology, there are no distractions. And I believe as a species, especially in Western cultures, we are so chronically distracted, we don't even realize we're distracted. Everywhere around you are being bombarded with information and corrective guidance, right from like fucking road signs to books, to podcasts, to radio shows, to TV, to phones, to Instagram. We're constantly chronically distracted. And to be in a desert where there's no connectivity, where there's no distractions, when you're waking up with the sun every morning and you're going to bed with the sunset, and your only obligation is to ensure that you're hydrated, that you're nourished, that you're sleeping well, and you're doing your fizz, is immeasurably rewarding. And for me, it's certainly invigorated a hunger for more freedoms from distraction for the rest of my life. The second favorite thing I took away from the desert was genuine human connection. As I've already spoken about, we are so chronically distracted and we tend to only communicate now via spoken word over text message or video calls or Instagram. And as a result, everyone has a kind of alter ego. They're not really who they say they are. They show you, meaningfully or not, just a slither of their existence and a highlight reel. Whereas when you're in that bivouac and you're all going through it together, you're all washing together, sleeping together, not literally, um, eating, drinking water together, running together, there's no room, there's no energy, and there's no possibility to be something that you're not. And as a result, it created the most deep, authentic, genuine human connection where the laughs are real. Who you are presenting is authentically you and all of the ego just dies and washes away. And that authentic human connection, that brotherhood, that shared common interest and that shared common goal is so powerful and truly brings people together. And again, that is something I'm gonna be continuing to seek out more in everyday human life. So one of the most frequently asked questions I've had since finishing the event was like, how are you feeling now? How's the body? So on and so forth. Um, I'm gonna be totally transparent and, and absolutely honest with you. I have never been more fatigued and exhausted in my entire life. Um, from the moment we stepped off the course, unfortunately, I went down with Africa's finest diarrhea and vomiting, and I spent a full like 36 hours basically with my head and ass in a toilet and a one-place change system for, for the entirety. It really does take out of me. My body was totally exhausted. I managed to get home on the Monday, um, and then all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, I've just never slept so much. And to this point, a week after the event, I'm still not running yet. So when you do an event of this magnitude, you have to really respect it because when you talk about high performance and, and being ambitious, so on and so forth, it's very easy to fall into quite a critical mindset of yourself when you get back that you should be able to run the distances you were in preparation, that you should be performing to the same standard and extent that you were before you go away. And that's just not the reality. It is one of the most stressful things you could ask the human body to do. And I'm no different to that. I'm speaking to other competitors and other guys from 1078 and they're all saying the same, like I'm just sleeping a hell of a lot, but equally I'm allowing it. I'm accepting it, I'm surrendering to it, and I'm giving myself permission because this is one of the hardest things to earn on the face of the fucking earth. So having that time, having that space to just sit with your thoughts and emotions and not worry about doing enough, but actually just taking a moment to hold stock for what it is you've done, what it is you've achieved, and the person you became to facilitate that is, is really special and really meaningful to me. Now, I'm back in the weight room. I'm back doing some sort of remedial strength and conditioning, looking at getting the body moving, contracting muscle, and, and building um, a good foundational piece in order for me to build and move forwards. But as for running, I'm gonna be doing my first run at the weekend, which will be two full weeks post MDS. I can honestly say I didn't expect to fall in love with running the way I did through this preparatory period, but I have missed it so dearly over this week that I've had off. So I am really, really looking forward to getting back into it. And as for what's next, well, we'll talk about that. And as quickly as it started, that is pretty much it. And it's almost nostalgic. In fact, it's truly sad to see the end of this Marathon the Saab series because I look at the naive, ambitious person that I was when I started this process. And I look at what we've endured what we've created, what we've been able to achieve. And I look back with nothing but immense, almost immeasurable pride. And that's not, I guess, to be taken as arrogance. I'm truly proud of what it is I've been able to achieve. And I'm also truly grateful for every single person who's been able to share along in this journey with me, who's hopefully taken at least one thing away from it, whether that be inspiration or whether that's been course correction. I'm not, ah, oh, fuck's sake. Um, try a bit again. Yeah. All right. 
So as quickly as it started, it comes to an end. This past series of months has absolutely flown by. Um, and for me, it is truly a moment of absolute pride and, a, and of gratitude and satisfaction and fulfillment to look back at the ambitious but very naive person I was when I started this process, to look at everything that we've done, all the hard work we put in, everything we've created, and ultimately what we're able to achieve is probably one of the proudest feats of my life. I don't know what it is that will be that could ever potentially surpass that or if I should even try and surpass it. But for every single person who has watched this, who has followed along, who has engaged, who has offered a word of support, who followed me in the event, I cannot like truly deeply enough articulate my gratitude and appreciation for you because this is not just about me, this is about the me and the we. So if you've taken away a single lesson, a soundbite, something that is in any way, shape or form motivated, inspired, helped, informed you, then I'm truly grateful for you because this has been very, very hard to create but also truly inspiring, deeply fulfilling and will go down for me as some of my life's greatest work. So thank you for following along. Thank you for following in this journey, something that I'm enormously proud of and I hope it's been of service and of use to any of you out there. If, however, you do want to hear more and a day-by-day -day breakdown and run-through of what life is like in the camp, what the terrain was like that we experienced, and some fun anecdotal quips about a lot of people having a shit, then please do check out the Hard to Kill podcast, because there I'm going to go through a full rundown of day-by-day -day life in camp, what happens, how it happens, when it happens, and why it happens, how we responded to it, and hopefully inspire you to do something great yourself too.